back to AP government um, in this lesson we are going to go over the Bill of Rights understanding what rights are and the First Amendment in the next several lectures we will go into depth of the United States Constitution so civil liberties are those specific individual rights that cannot be taken away by government and are guaranteed by the Constitution, such as the freedom of expression and the right of protection against self-incrimination. Now, there's a big difference between civil liberties and civil rights. Now, civil rights are different from civil, um, civil rights or equal rights. Um, a more modern term that refers specifically to the rights that members of various groups, no matter their race, ethnicity, or sexual orientation, have equal treatment by government under the law and equal access to society's opportunities. So, what are rights? Rights are powers or privileges to which individuals are entitled. The central question when it comes to rights is where do rights come from and are they absolute? Now, as we learned in our first lecture, that natural rights are based on the natural laws of human society. They exist even in the absence of a formal government and no government cannot take them, take them away. So in the Declaration of Independence and in the constitution thomas jefferson and the founding fathers called these unalienable rights now a liberty refers to a right received from a higher authority such as a government the framers argued with the term in the nation's founding documents now the right so for an example so the right of an indigent person's right to a lawyer paid by the state in felony cases is considered to be a positive right, meaning that um, you're meeting the needs of your citizens even though they might have broken the law. Now, the purpose of the Constitution when it comes to rights. So, the purpose of the Constitution was intended to provide individuals with protection by guaranteeing a framework of limited government based on a theory of enumerated powers. And we know that to be um, Article 1 of the Constitution. Now, the Barron case, which follows the Marshall Court, held that the Bill of Rights restricted only the national government, not the states. The state courts of New York, Illinois, and Mississippi had applied portions of the Bill of Rights against their states. Similar approaches were advocated in Ohio and later refused to find the amendments applicable to the states. This case came from Barron's suit against the city for ruining the use of his wharf in Baltimore Harbor. The case stemmed from the Fifth Amendment, where it guarantees that private property shall not be taken for public use with you just compensation. The outcome rejected Barron's argument that this provision ought to be construed as to restrain the legislative power of a state as well as that of the United States. Now, what is incorporation? Incorporation is the process by which the Supreme Court uses the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment to make applicable to the states most of the individual rights guaranteed by the Bill of Rights. Incorporation provided that the state and local go government, as well as the federal government, could not deny these rights to citizens. So, in this process, the states are re were required to live up to the dictation to the dictation of the First Amendment free speech clause beginning in 1925. In the 14th Amendment, the right against unreasonable searches and seizures beginning in 1961, and the Sixth Amendment right to a speedy trial in 1967. 
Now, by 1969, almost every provision of the Bill of Rights had been applied to state governments through the incorporation doctor doctrine. So basically what they did is that the rights that were in the Bill of Rights obviously were only limited in the scope of the federal government. What they did with the incorporation process is that those amendments, those rights, were actually given to the states for them to be actually identified and enacted to the citizens of that state. Now, let's get into the First Amendment, which highlights the freedom of religion and the Establishment Clause. Now, the First Amendment states, which was ratified in 1791, states that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably assemble, and to petition the government to a re redress of grievances. Now, the First Amendment offered one of there's written guarantees of religious freedom and to form the basis of extensive free speech and free press protections as well. This amendment has never conveyed absolute freedom to Americans. In the Supreme Court, in Supreme Court history, as specifically attempted, um, ex, I'm sorry, exempt, exempted obscenity, libel, fighting words, and incitement from free speech protections. Not has the separate and independent provision of the freedom of the press been interpreted at, to give members of the press been interpreted to give members of the press any protection that is afforded to ordinary citizens. Although the first words of the amendment implies its prote its protections apply only against actions of the federal government, but today it offers protection against the state governments as well. So, like I said in the incorporation doctrine. The, this, the protections are not just only limited to the federal government, but it's also given to the states as well. Now, the freedom of religion and the establishment clause is stated in uh, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion of prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So, a little historical background of this of this clause is that in Protestantism played a highly influential role in public life and the First Amendment was intended to provide a limited barrier against its influence. influence. In 1802, Thomas Jefferson described the First Amendment as erecting a wall of separation between church and state. There is no existing official church of the United States. Government aid to religion to certain Protestant sects. Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and Amish were forced to change or abandon some of their religious practices whenever public policy conflicted with them. And you will certainly see this clearly as we get into the Supreme Court cases a little bit later in this lecture and to see what the Supreme Court ruled um, and what the reasoning behind that was. Now, onto the Free Exercise Clause. Um, the Free Exercise Clause of, is the Religious Freedom Clause in the First Amendment that denies government the ability to prohibit the free exercise of religion. Debate over the clause was largely focused on whether government laws can force adherents of a certain religion to engage and activate and activate it that are prohibited by their religious beliefs or prevent them from performing acts that are compelled by their religious beliefs. This prohibits the free exercise of religion. Now, according to Sullivan and Gunther, the free exercise clauses raises two issues. Number one, exercise implies more than belief or expression. It often implies conduct or action. And two, establishment clause has no parallel in the speech clause. So, obviously, in the free exercise clause, you have a freedom to freely express your religion, but the establishment clause has nothing to do with us with protection of speech. Now, when the Supreme Court rules on these types of cases, they first look at the question at the question whether government can deliberately disadvantage religion or particular religion, and second at 
whether religious practitioners are in title to exemption from religious applicable laws that conflict with with dictates of their faith now you can see these actions from the supreme court cases from the following cases so the first one is west virginia state board of education versus barnett of 1943 so the supreme court ruled that that ordered schools officials to reinstate the children of Jehovah's Witnesses who had been suspended for refusing to salute the American flag in their public classrooms. In Sherbert v. Verner in 1963, the Supreme Court ruled that the state of South Carolina to pay unemployment benefits to the Seventh-day Adventists who refused to work on Saturdays. The Supreme Court declared that only a compelling state interest could justify denying her such an exemption on the basis of religion. So what interest courts has as compelling? The court must be convinced that the government program would be significantly undermined by religious exemptions to say that the government's interest is compelling. In Wisconsin v. Yoder in 1972, the Supreme Court ruled that members of the Amish religion were not required to send their children to school after the 8th grade. Furthermore, the enforcement of that law would undermine Amish religion's principles, which include the value of learning through doing and support for community welfare over all other interests. Then, in 1990, Employment Division v. Smith, the Supreme Court ruled that the state's legitimate interest in maintaining its unemployment insurance fund at a higher level outweighed the Native Americans' religious rights and denied the two men unemployment benefits. State government may choose to accommodate otherwise illegal acts done in pursuit of religious beliefs, but they are not required to do so. Now, this re case remains remains the rule of judicial interpretation of free exercise cases. So instead of being forced to show a compelling government interest, which extremely, which is extremely hard to do so, um, a government interest in applying its neutral laws over religious objection may do so based on any legitimate state interest it might claim. Now, the Establishment Clause prohibits the government from enacting laws respecting an establishment of government. Now, it can be divided into two groups. One, separation. Advocate a strict dividing line between church and state, which holds that government should, not have, should have no involvement whatsoever in religious practices although religion remains free to flourish privately on its, own, on its own resources. Now, in the second one is accommodation. Hold, it holds that government neutrality toward religion requires only that it treat all religions equally. George, most Americans take it for granted that during the holiday season, they will see Chris, Christmas decorations uh, prominently displayed in government buildings, in front of the town hall and in public squares. But what about nativity scenes, menorahs, the Ten Commandments? What types, types of religious activities and symbols are considered acceptable in public places and which runs run a afoul of the First Amendment, whose prohibition of government? Respecting an establishment of religion has been interpreted to mean creating a wall of separation between church and state. So basically, what we're saying is that what prevents uh, other types of religions expressing their um, religion and also, you know, what, uh, what, what stops, what prevents a government entity from displaying the Ten Commandments uh, in their state or even having Christmas trees 
in the White House. So would that be a violation of the Establishment Clause when the White House and the Capitol building and other government entities can freely express Christianity? What, you know, that's the question that is being raised. So in response, the Supreme Court has moved from a position of especially strict separation to one that shifts back and forth between principles of separation and accommodation. So they have used both of these principles of separation and accommodation uh, in order to rule in First Amendment Establishment Clause cases. Now, in Ingle v. Vattel, in 1962, the Supreme Court's ruling invalidated the New York public school's policy of having each class recite a specific, spec- a specified non-denominational religious prayer each day, w- which was in violation of the First Amendment's prohibition against the establishment of religion. So we will cover this case in greater detail, but I just wanted to go over how uh, the First Amendment has in especially the establishment clause and how the supreme court has ruled in that but we will go over this case very specifically in more detail the next case uh abington school district v shimp in 1963 the supreme court ruled by refusing to allow spiritual bible reading in public school classrooms so um here's a cool um newspaper article about the Supreme Court case in Abington Schools uh, School District. Next one is Wallace v. Uh, Je- Jeffrey in 1985. In this case, um, the Supreme Court ruled by outlawing moments of silence authorized by government officials to encourage religious prayer during the during those moments the supreme court held that in neither of those instances was the government acting with a secular purpose on not grounded in a desire to advance religion so the supreme court realized that having a moment of silence of someone in memory who has died maybe in service uh, whether it's a senator, a military official, that they believe that that was not advancing a, a, a particular specific religion. In Zelman v. Simmons, Harris, in 2002, the Supreme Court upheld a system of private school vouchers whereby parents are given coupons that can be used to pay tuition at private schools, including parochial schools. In 1971, certain issues involving separation of church and state had been governed by the Lemon Test outlined by the Supreme Court by the Lemon v. Kurtzman of 1971. Now, the Lemon Test uh, is used to find out violations of the Establishment Clause. So when the Supreme Court has a, a case in where the establishment clause is in question, they will use the lemon test in order to make their ruling. So the criteria required to ascend an establishment clause attack, one, they must have a secular legislature purpose. Two, its principal or primary effect must be one that neither advances nor inhibits religion. And number three, must foster an excessive government entanglement with religion. What are the criticisms of the Lemon Test? According to Sullivan and Gunther, the purpose requirement taken literally could invalidate all deliberate government accommodation of religion, even even through such accommodations is sometimes required by the Free Exercise Clause and has sometimes been held permissible under the Establishment Clause, even if it's not constitutionally compelled. Two, the legislative purpose, in any case, is difficult to ascertain in a multi-member body. So basically, you know, having the uh, three branches of, of government. So, and then three, the entanglement prong contradicts the previous two two some administrative entanglement is essential to ensure that government aid 
guys not excessively promote religious purposes. So um, having, you know, the grants today, as I stated earlier, should not only specifically heavily excessively promote religious purposes. So grants and aid can, can not only be uh, exclusive to religious purposes, that it should be for education, um, public policy, and other initiatives within that particular state that is in need or city. Now, the court has relied less on the lemon test in recent recent cases in the Supreme Court. So you can see sometimes that you, uh, in maybe even current Supreme Court cases, uh, that some Supreme Court justices may not quote the lemon test in their um, in their reasoning behind their ruling. Now, in Levy Wiseman in 1992, the Supreme Court ruled that a middle school to stop its practice in reading prayers at the school's graduation ceremony, even though attendance was voluntary. In Santa Fe v. Doe in 2000, the Supreme Court ruled that a student-led prayer before a football game at a Texas public school violated the separation of church and state. The court believed that both practices forced all those present to participate in an act of religious worship. These practices could have been interpreted as state endorsements of prayer, which is unconstitutional. In Schneck v. United States in 1919, uh, the Supreme Court ruled and established the clear and present danger test. Uh, furthermore, they stated that there was, in fact, a clear and present danger that the pamphlet could bring about the damage between claimed by the government by the government. So we will go over this case more in detail as well and clearly go over the p clear and present danger test as well. And lastly, Dennis v. United States in 1951, the Supreme Court ruled by giving a measure credibility to the Red Scare when it upheld the convictions of numerous communist def defendants for teaching and advocating the overthrow and destruction of the government of the United States. Now, this Supreme Court case was a way to prevent the spread uh, not only of communism in, in the world during the Cold War, but also in the United States. So the United States had a had a reasoning behind this particular Supreme Court case to prevent the spread of communism. And as you know, this actually sparked the Cold War um, in, in Russia and even during the time of Reagan. Um, so you can see this going on after the Cold War, the Red Scare. Um, so it, it was this fear of communism even after uh, the World War II was, was over. Um, so this concludes our uh, lecture on the First Amendment, um, an introduction to that. The next lecture we will go over the Second, Third, Fourth, and uh, Fifth and Sixth Amendments. Um, in our next lecture, so please make sure you read uh, the second through six six amendments so you are prepared on the National Constitutional Center uh, Constitution. Make sure you read that so you are prepared. Um, if you have any questions, you can certainly let me know. And I uh, hope you have a wonderful day. Bye.